We'll start with Mattel. And Edena Lowe is currently the Vice President from Supply Chain Governance, Risk Management, Compliance, and Sustainability. And as we all know, Mattel is one of the world's largest toy manufacturers. It's actually the second largest after Lego. We all use in our youth or with our children that some of the toy Fisher Price, Barbie, and Matchbox. Ed and I joined Mattel 10 years ago in the Asia Pacific Department for Government Affairs and Lego. She evolved in time to include EHS and regulatory affairs, and she then got supply chain on the global level in 2013. Her key objective today is to talk about the toy industry and how they want to be part of the solution. By working on the operational footprint and by working on sustainable product solutions. So let's listen to Edena. Thank you, Godfrey. Morning, everybody. Um, as Godfrey said, I'm between you and lunch, so we'll uh, make this as um, easy as possible. So um, just to expand a little bit on uh, what Godfrey was saying, so I take care of supplier responsibility as well as sustainability um, at Mattel. Uh, our footprint uh, is both internal and external, so we have about 14 factories globally that manufacture our product. We also have about 50 suppliers, uh, predominantly in the Asia region, uh, that make product for us. I think the, the, the biggest differentiator between internal and external is uh, we try and keep um, a lot of the, the things that are core to us, like um, Fashion Dolls, Barbie, um, as well as our die-cast cars, um, Hot Wheels, Matchbox, um, internal because it's platform-driven and it's easier for us to, to take care of that. And then we leave the other uh, more fickle um, stuff that kids um, you know, change their minds about more frequently uh, to our suppliers um, globally. Uh, we're going through a little bit of a transformation at Mattel. Um, we got a new CEO, Inon, and he comes from the entertainment industry. So I think uh, you're going to see more and more um, our forays into the entertainment industry. Uh, we, we just uh, created a new films unit. And what we're, we're trying to do is focus a lot on how the supply chain actually um, supports that. Meaning, um, and you've seen, we've, uh, we're going to be divesting um, our Mexico facilities uh, and look for more um, suppliers on the outside to be uh, much swifter in the way that we meet um, the entertainment industry uh, demands. So I think, um, let me switch gears a little bit to, to what we do at Mattel from a uh, uh, transparency and uh, visibility perspective. So I think that there are a few areas that um, I can speak to in terms of our experience um, in these uh, couple of areas. From a uh, traceability perspective, I think um, you might be familiar with the recalls that we had in 07. Um, I think the industry went through a bit of a um, uh, transformation in terms of how we look at product safety. How do we manage through uh, a very lengthy uh, supply chain from raw materials all the way to uh, finished product? Um, and those two can be in very, very different parts of the world. Uh, so from a chemical perspective, a lot of what we do is um, we've developed chemical management databases that we now uh, run. So we have um, an ingredients list, or what we call a bill of substance, that we demand um, from our suppliers uh, in the area of product safety, and that helps us manage. And that is audited um, both through internal folks as well as um, outside folks. Uh, the second area um, around human rights um, and labor practices, we, because we're in the toy industry, 90% uh, of our finished goods suppliers actually are on the um, ICTI, uh, ethical toy program. Um, they have an office in London. Uh, their CEO is based here. Um, but they do run a pretty uh, robust audit um, uh, operation based between Hong Kong, uh, Shenzhen, and um, some other growing parts of Asia like uh, Vietnam and, and India as well. And that's where predominantly most of the um, finished goods suppliers are. 
their requirements uh, in collaboration with a lot of the other brands and retailers are uh, to use um, uh, certified auditors that provide audit reports at least on an annual basis um, in a bit to, to figure out whether the conditions that the workers in the supply chain are subject to are safe, um, healthy, and obviously uh, respectful uh, in terms of how they're paid um, and the hours uh, they work. So from a visibility uh, perspective, that's how we uh, get uh, most of our intelligence into the supply chain from a labor practices perspective. Um, the third area, and I, I think that someone from Rainforest Alliance here today, is how we manage um, our sustainability um, sourcing. So we um, have public commitments to meet uh, sourcing targets in the area of paper as well as wood fiber. Um, and the partnership with Rainforest Alliance allows us to take surveys uh, from our suppliers. They are then subject to uh, the requirements of having to provide documentation to prove out um, where they get um, their fibers from. Uh, they have to ensure that the chain of custody is not broken and that is audited through the Rainforest um, Alliance team and that, that data is then reported um, uh, by us annually. So that's the third area of uh, traceability that um, we can share. Back to you. Thank you very much, Elena. I think uh, probably we'll come back to you later to ask uh, how this uh, visibility and transparency help you in terms of uh, decision-making, culture, and uh, reputation. So um, let me introduce Roel Drost, the next speaker. Roel is actually the Director of Strategy and Large Account at EcoChain Technology. He before worked for Ernst & Young and uh, as a Senior Manager for Climate Change and Sustainability and also worked for Philips. Uh, semiconductor, where he was a supply chain project manager. He want, his goal is to make environmental performance available to everyone, and he's going to explain how EcoChain innovative software help organization measure, manage, monetize the environmental impact and its process and its products. So the floor is your role. Thank you, uh, Godefroy. It's a pl real pleasure to be here. Um, I'll be talking about environmental footprinting in supply chains uh, this morning. And I have a couple of case studies to, uh, to share with you. Um, but I wanted to go back first 50 years ago, because that was uh, the year that we first set foot on the moon, and we actually made a footprint on the moon. But it was also the year that Coca-Cola made its, its first life cycle assessment. And that created a foundation for something that we are still using today. Although in those years it was really experimental and innovative. It's now a world that is really well established and we're using those, uh, those standards are used all across the world. So let me take you a bit on the hand, and I'm sure most of you are well aware of this, but let's make sure that we all have the same foundation. What is a life cycle assessment? A life cycle assessment allows you to assess environmental impacts across the entire value chain, from cradle to grave, or, and it's not only looking at climate change, it's looking at all the other aspects like ozone depletion, particulate matter, and, and what have you. So it gives you the real integrated view of how a product performs over its entire life cycle. So we're discussing cotton quite often today. I'm wearing a wrinkle-free cotton uh, shirt, which is really beneficial in its use phase because I have to iron it less. But in fact, chemicals have been used during the manufacturing stage to make sure it's wrinkle-free. Huh? So you need to make a balanced decision to make sure that you cover everything and have the real integrated view. More recently, we are starting to monetize the environmental impacts. Um, and then we are really starting to put a price tag on nature. And we're starting to price in those externalities. I'll get back to that in a couple of minutes. So, and, and this, uh, this, uh, this next slide, what I, what I want to take you through is, is the key message, you know, companies 
do have an own footprint, which is called the scope one and two emissions in the greenhouse gas protocol, but actually the majority of the impact is always happening outside the value chain in the use phase of the products or earlier upstream. So we took a couple of examples here, a textile brand, electronics, and for that electronics firm, I will show you a bit more. Um, although those emissions and impacts are not happening on the company premises, they are the majority of impacts, and companies do have levers to really make a change there. What I wanted to show to you is a case study that we did for Philips Electronics. Um, Philips is a uh, health tech company. So they produce uh, hospital, uh, high-tech hospital equipment like MRI scanners, but also consumer lifestyle uh, equipment like rice cookers or coffee makers. And what we, what we did, we, uh, we created what we call environmental intelligence for them. So we looked at their entire product portfolio, all the products across the entire value chain, from cradle to grave. So at the left-hand side of the, of the picture, you see the upstream part. And at the right-hand side, you see the use part and the end of life and the waste phase. The middle part, the smaller bubbles, are the manufacturing of Philips themselves, which comprise only 4% of the total. Um, what is good to know is that, that, that this uh, not only gave a holistic picture of the company, it was also presented at the shareholder meeting, and it, and it received reasonable assurance from the external account at EY. But let's zoom in on this thing a little bit more. So, we have the company hotspots now, but what it also enabled Philips to do is to really zoom into the products. And what they soon learned is that it, it's not those big MRI scanners which create the impact. No, it's the hair dryers, it's the rice cookers. That's where the impact is happening. And you know, we, we've got in this system, we've got the whole bill of material, so we can zoom in one level deeper and then we know exactly which components are responsible for making that impact. It's the printed circuit boards, it's the copper cables. Well, you can even go one level deeper. You can go to supplier level. So we are using a system where we are able to consolidate all the environmental impacts of these products. They roll up to a, into a company footprint, but we're also able to assess product footprints and supply footprints because this is a collaborative platform where multiple companies can cooperate together. So, and they are sharing their consolidated results on the platform. And I know you will be asking me later about how about confidentiality. Well, please feel free to ask me that question. Um, but the consolidated result can be shared into the platform so that Companies can work with real data from their supply chain and not just the industry averages. I know that most companies are still using industry averages. The problem with that is, is that you're not able to see the improvements that you're making. And hence, it was, it's very challenging to manage those improvements. Please bear with me for two minutes. I've got a short movie to show to you. I hope it works. The world is facing severe environmental challenges. We strongly believe that cooperation between companies in the supply chain is crucial in facing these challenges, but will also be the new driver of growth and profit. However, companies can't cooperate without a universal platform to share sustainability data. This is why we started EcoChain. Found that companies first need to know the environmental impact of their energy and material use to be able to cooperate. We invented and apply a method called activity-based footprinting. This enables companies to measure and manage their sustainability performance. On production site level, zoom into process level, product level, and even to that of materials. Our dashboards can reveal saving potentials and provide insights in where to invest most effectively. 
For instance, it might show that changing to green electricity is not as effective as choosing a more sustainable material from a greener supplier. The EcoChain's network functionality allows you to safely share results with value chain partners. The environmental impact of energy and material becomes transparent. Now your company can benefit from green initiatives in the supply chain, making your company both greener and more profitable. EcoChain. Higher growth and a better planet. Interesting. Being uh, involved in the supply chain before, I can tell you that uh, being able to do life cycle analysis and being able to go back to the bottom you know, uh, of the uh, usage of the material is very, very difficult. In fact, uh, we use the World Business Council for Sustainable Development to create the first standard for life cycle analysis. 11 chemical companies joined force under their cluster of chemical to do that a few years ago, and that became a standard because they were not even a standard. So one of the questions I will have for Royal later is, good, but uh, so what's the difference between how difficult it is to use accurate data like you are suggesting versus uh, industry average? what the cost to do that, because we have done that one or twice and it's much more expensive. Can we afford to do that as a company? That will be one of the questions um, I may have for you all. So let me introduce uh, Jessica, Jessica Camus from DigiNex. Jessica is the head of partnership and impact at DigiNex. She started at the World Economic Forum and worked on the entrepreneurial ship and innovation as well as on gender and future of jobs for several years before you know, getting into this new uh, experience with DigiNex. I had a very interesting conversation with her how they use blockchain to be able to create that transparency and trustability that we are just talking about. So I'm gonna leave the floor to her so that she can share and explain how they work with corporation, institution, and government to create the trust that we're talking about and increase the efficiency. Jessica? Thanks, Godfrey. Hi, everyone. It's a great pleasure um, to be here. As he said, we are a global blockchain solutions company uh, focused on transforming business and creating greater efficiencies and protecting society. Um, in terms of blockchain, I just wanted to quickly get a check of the room. Um, how familiar are you with blockchain? Who considers themselves pretty well familiar with blockchain? Yeah, it's about half of the room. Uh, I don't know the presentation. Anyhow, I wanted to um, just very quickly to get everybody to the same level of knowledge, give uh, a definition, there are many definitions. Um, but blockchain is a new way of storing transaction data and value powered by a trustless system of computers which does not require a governing, uh, governing party. So in the context of supply, uh, supply chains, this essentially means that you can record data around location, price, um, uh, and, and qualities of goods at every point in a transaction, and over time create an uh, immutable record, a history of all transactions, making it possible to trace goods from the source to the end consumer. Now we at DigiNex, we actually go one step further and decided to focus um, on the human aspect within supply chains and really with the broader mission of addressing the issues of forced labor and slavery. Many of you have supply chains that are fairly complex um, and abroad uh, and are working with a network of suppliers that are outsourcing the labor procurement. So, so far it's been really difficult um, and there have been no trusted mechanisms to ensure that you can actually trace down to the individual worker and clearly understand the employment conditions. And that's precisely what we are working on. So to give you a specific example, we have partnered with an organization called the Mekong Club. It's an anti-slavery business association um, comprised of over 30 uh, members from retail and apparel um, sectors and footwear as well. Uh, many of those are European uh, multinationals, uh, very familiar to you all, uh, that have complex supply chains in Asia. So we are uh, developing a tool which is essentially an auditing tool that will allow companies 
to gain better um, visibility and traceability of worker conditions uh, and employment fees. Those two, the, the worker conditions and agency fees, are actually the main two drivers why workers, and, and specifically migrant workers, are being trapped in the very difficult forced labor situations. In terms of agency fees, well, what happens is that um, for a worker uh, to be employed, he usually contracts with an agency. This agency then arranges for logistics, visa, travel, um, but because the fee is very high, the worker is almost forced to take on a loan. And this debt instrument is then really used as a means for control to keep the worker uh, in, in trapped in these conditions. In terms of the working contract, well, what happens there is that a worker signs certain conditions, provided that he understands uh, the contract in the first place, but once he arrives at the factory, uh, well, the conditions are really not met, and he ends up working many more hours and being paid less than what has been promised, and there are no means to signal um, or report on the breach of contractual arrangement. So what we are working on with the Mekong Club is a new um, tool, so a technology blockchain-based tool, where the agencies uh, and the factories, as well as the migrant workers, lock their work contracts and the associated fees onto a blockchain, here with creating an immutable track record of the working conditions. Now for the migrant workers, this is a very important tool because essentially it allows him um, to have a, a, a reference or a, a proof of the conditions that he has uh, signed up for uh, and no one can take it away from him. So I'm really creating a, a new uh, dynamic in terms of uh, a trust mechanism. For the companies, um, what we in, in envisage um, is that this tool will be used as a, a, an internal auditing tool um, for uh, well, creating actions uh, around uh, areas where improvement needs to happen and really driving uh, the, the companies internally to work with those agencies that are actually open and accepting uh, the implementation of this tool but also using it, this tool as a means of working with regulatory agencies and actually having a means of proof uh, of adherence uh, to legislative um, uh, uh, requirements. And then we are also uh, working on an interface where there will be a, a level of aggregated data sharing um, that will be made public uh, well, first of all, uh, for an exchange between companies so that companies have much more visibility uh, and means of discussion of, well, who are actually the good actors, what are the, the, the suppliers that are using this tool and are being transparent and fair with the workers, but also reporting this data to international organizations, nonprofits, uh, and governments. Uh, so having a, a level of aggregated data sharing that really makes it possible um, to, to track uh, and, and make it transparent uh, to the greater public. So this is a very, very simple prototype. Um, I just wanted to show here, so this is kind of the, the interface or how the interface could look like uh, in terms of uh, data and we're, we're calling it corridors um, because what um, we have identified as our first pilot projects, it's very much focused on migrant workers specifically and looking actually also at the migrant worker flows uh, and on where they're being hired to. So that uh, is part of what will be captured with, with this. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jessica. This uh, issue of traceability of working condition is, is one that is very difficult to, uh, to tackle, uh, especially if you're a member of the United uh, Global, signatory of the UN Global Compact. Uh, one of the 10 principles is that you will uh, uh, work against, you know, uh, improve working condition and work against forced labor. So this could be an interesting discussion on uh, later on on uh, what success look like, you know, for, for you, Jessica. Let me introduce uh, the last uh, speaker from our panel, Nina Van Radovic from Metro. Um, she's at the head of the corporate responsibility at Metro. And as you may know, Metro is a leading international specialist in wholesale 
and food retail. It operates in 35 countries and employs more than 150,000 people with a turnover of 37 billion. So it is a quite a large retail uh, chain. And uh, Nina is a lawyer by background. She joined Metro Austin Regulatory Affair and Evolve into sustainability and now in charge of the whole corporate responsibility. Uh, I went and read their report, quite fascinating uh, report. And so she's gonna explain how Metro set the standard for uh, their uh, business model and for their supplier. Nina? Just um, to give some visuals to the figures that you've just heard. Um, so thanks for having me here, first of all. Um, yes, Metro is a very big company. Um, and we just heard the figures. And um, well, along with um, the great responsibility, also obligation comes in hand. Um, but actually, if you see our portfolio, and uh, you have re referred to Metro as, uh, well, not the underground line and, and not the taxi company and all that stuff, but it's actually retail. To be very precise, it's actually more specifically wholesale. So it's not the end consumer being our direct um, customer, but it's actually the ho hotels, restaurants, and caterings. And we've, of course, found a very nice uh, abbreviation, which is Horeca. Um, we also move a lot into the food service um, distribution channels. Um, so we've somewhat unfolded new potentials in that area. So it's not just only bricks and mortar, so the stores that you may know from recent times, at least also in the UK, the macro stores, the blue big boxes. Um, we've actually moved out of Britain, but um, um, we're in many other countries. Um, well, along with, uh, as I just said, the size of our company, we, of course, uh, are also proud to actually have such a great lever. So actually, we think we actually can make a difference. If we steer our company right, we actually can make a difference because we have such a lever. It's not just the stores and the employees as such being the um, sustainability ambassadors, but it's actually the great number of suppliers, our contractual partners. We have um, about 50,000 um, suppliers in our portfolio. So that's actually where we, can, uh, where we can make a difference. And of course, then it's the customers and the countless consumers, after all, that actually um, can make a change, all of us together. On the other hand, of course, that also means the threat on our company um, is always at a critical point because it's just like that will be um, at the risk of um, our own reputation. So basically, if we look into that funny slide where um, the graphic has moved into um, the headline, um, you will see basically the strategy that we believe in is that we do deal with resources. I mean, that's what we do. That's trading with resources is our core business. So we also believe in actually managing them most responsibly. Um, so it is all about empowering people. It is all about securing our planet. Um, and that only just goes through enhancing this with partnerships and actually unfolding prosperity after all. So this is in order to fulfill our purpose, the mission that we're, that we're after. And of course, the SDGs, um, no need to say, I think that's the, like, um, the global framework that supports us in actually achieving our targets. So now, when it comes to um, the supply chain management, um, I would like to just um, quickly go through this, basically the, um, the plan that we're trying to follow, because after all, um, we believe it's it could be very simple because it's a master plan and if you just follow the plan then it should go, should go right. And in the end it doesn't even really matter if you look into, let's say, carbon supply chain, so carbon emissions, um, or if you look into human rights uh, aspects within your supply chain, in the end it's the same, same but different. Um, because it's all about really the supply chain management and then the content, after all, um, needs to be uh, worked out. So what we figure is that um, you will actually look into, you, and you elaborated on the difference um, between transparency and traceability. To me, transparency actually is the start, but it's also the outcome of what we try to achieve. Um, because in the end, you need transparency in order to be transparent in the, uh, in the end. And having a traceability tool, or using traceability, in order to actually then reach transparency, then makes the actual difference and will lead to a successful supply chain management. Um, so the master plan uh, really is that we 
need to start with information and awareness in the first place. It, as easy as it sounds, we always realize how difficult it is, not only within our own organization, with our purchasing departments, to really or increase the understanding of the need of transparency um, through our supply chain. This is not just done by actually having great contracts, uh, which uh, um, ensure all the liability issues, but actually to also um, define the standards that we need to benchmark ourselves against and that we actually want to have our suppliers um, been benchmarked against. Then, um, being such a big company, sometimes, often, to be very honest, feels like sitting in a tanker, so it moves slowly, but um, one of the um, main stakeholders within our own department or within our own company, obviously, is our um, top management. So basically, we need to steer also from the top. Of course, it needs to be backed up by the bottom, but we also realize that the commitment of our management um, in order to really carry it through the organization is crucial. Um, and then, well, after all, the process, which is, uh, which is the key um, element here. And um, if we talk about supply chain management, after all, you could even talk to controlling people or controlling department because it's all about data. It's all about actually disclosing the data throughout your supply chain together with your suppliers in partnership. I refer to this as one of the, the key elements. Um, and then, um, yeah, challenging enough, but the maintenance of that data. So looking into the size of 50,000 suppliers and actually having that data into a system in the first place and then actually keeping it up to date um, in the second step, that is one of the challenges. So we actually better have a good tool. Um, and I think this could be a panel discussion in itself because having good tools and interconnected tools is um, a real challenge, at least in our company. And um, if I look into the management systems that we, that we work with in, in our company, we, for example, have one which is dedicated to carbon counting. So we do the entire carbon counting of our own operations. Um, so really going into the supply chain will be will have to be the next step on that one. And SSM is, the, again, the nice uh, abbreviation for social standards management, and that really goes into the supply chain. So let's say human rights and, and, and fundamental rights within our own operations, fair working conditions with our own employees is the one thing, but the, this tool, SSM, is really going into the supply chain. The focus um, is on own brand products, um, of course, that kind of reduces the number of 50,000 to a bit more tangible masses, um, but it's still challenging enough. Um, and the, the masterpiece in the end will be actually then to connect this tool with our data warehouse system. So basically, when you onboard um, suppliers, it's a precondition that they, for example, fulfill certain requirements as in social standards compliance um, topics. And then reverse. Basically, if we block um, one supplier because of a major failure, you name it, child labor being one of the worst ones, obviously that actually needs to be um, put back into the system also in the data warehouse system that it's not just basically blocked in our system, but actually the supplier is really suspended from, from action. Um, and then, yes, of course, I mean, having new tools, having new processes, uh, the change management is probably the most crucial element because it's, well, us in the CR department having great ideas on paper and, and tools, etc. that's the one thing. But actually having the company, the purchasing departments, the department managers working with the tools and actually fulfilling the tasks as um, it is requested, that's the actual beauty then of the system. So we believe the success factors for a successful supply chain management system actually is to, for once to actually have a good process and a robust tool, which is interconnected with the regular standard systems that we use. Secondly, the incorporation in the daily work. So it's not to be considered as like the extra annoying stuff that you need to do for, I don't know, sustainability, the crazy green guys, but actually incorporate it in your daily work. So it's a regular part of your purchasing procedure. And the third and last part really is that we need to go through trainings, through partnership approaches um, in order to really embed it into the processes, not just only within our own company, but obviously along the entire supply chain. So easy like that, but challenging enough. I was going to say, this sounds very easy, and I hope everybody took a picture of that, but uh, 
the one that supplied those material are the one who have to supply the information and they need you know a very good system too so if you ha if you are at the end of the chain it's very hard to go back up the value chain and get accurate data to be able to have a, a true picture of your product. Uh, it was mentioned Philips today, and I think uh, Philips has put in their annual report the impact on natural capital they have for their product. It's quite interesting how they did it. So if you, if you want to look at a, a company that have integrated in their uh, annual financial report their use of uh, natural capital, go to the Philips uh, website and look at that uh, because that's quite interesting. So we have about um, 15 minutes uh, for question and let's look at, uh, wow, number, uh, we have a question from Mattel and then you uh, didn't use your seven minutes so you've got some time to pick, speak up there. How has Mattel created a business operating model and culture Maria, enough to respond to audit findings. Go ahead. Uh, that, that's an interesting question. Um, I think uh, there the, are the couple of things um, I would say to, to the, uh, the way that we've transformed. So I think in, in the past, for, for a long time, uh, whether it's a function of investors demanding it, uh, customer uh, having a checklist that you need to fulfill certain audit requirements, et cetera. It was uh, very much a check the box exercise. Um, so you, you simply go through, okay, I've got an audit, I passed, I, I submit the audit uh, report and you're done. So that audit report gets filed away in somebody's drawer and it's never looked at and then the next year you go through the same motions over and over again. Um, probably not uh, the best way to, to manage because there's, there's actually a lot of valuable information um, in, in the audit report. And so fr from, a, um, from a culture perspective, I would say one of the, the things that um, we did about uh, f four or five years now um, was uh, begin um, a bit of what we call a safety journey. So as you know, we manage a lot of factories um, globally, whether it's inside or outside. Uh, the, the last chief supply chain officer came from the chemical industry and was a huge proponent of using safety to drive both performance as well as uh, a transparent culture. Um, even simple things like escalating an incident ensuring that you get the right people on uh, the incident, trying to solve it, get root cause uh, figured out, et cetera, corrective actions put in place. And that process was, um, uh, and still being refined. Um, it, it's actually harder in implementation than it sounds. Theoretically, it's, it's simple. You, you go through it step by step, but I think to, to drive that into how you operate a business, um, a very lengthy supply chain. Um, for those who are not familiar with it, I, I highly recommend it. Uh, having led safety for, for um, a bit of my career during that time, uh, it was probably the most challenging um, time or challenging part of my career I've ever had, but the, the, the rewards are numerous. One, you, you learn um, a lot faster and quicker. So your, your folks um, at the ground level are forced into a, a, a different sort of um, management style where you do not get penalized for escalating problems. You must speak about them, you must collaborate because there are experts across um, the network, both in manufacturing as well as in corporate, who have the ability to brainstorm with you uh, um, and, and come up with the right solutions that make sense for the business. So I, I think that that culture sort of forced um, a, a step change in how we look at decision making, uh, accountability, um, and how we, we, we look at things as, as, a, as an entire business. Now, using that same discipline, um, what I'm trying now to do with, with audits is um, is actually have that same sort of uh, uh, discipline in terms of how we look at audit findings. How do we close them out? Do we 
do what we say we're going to do in terms of closing out timely um, and effectively. So uh, if you say that you know, you're going to put training in place, but the, the same finding keeps coming up, it's probably not, either it's not very good training or it's the wrong, um, it's the wrong um, action to be put in place. So things like that has driven sort of a, a step change in how we look at um, the use of, uh, of audit reports. Uh, secondary to that, um, and, and a big benefit of that is actually being able to consolidate the data that we're getting from audit reports, and then start to look at risk themes. What are some key big areas that uh, we face as a supply chain, whether it's in the, the sort of labor practices or whether it's in um, health and safety, how do you start to build risk themes? How do you start to then address them as a network and not individually? So you have scale in it and, and are able to put the best minds across the company uh, to solve what is um, uh, maybe a larger part of a problem in, in your supply chain than just have individuals struggle with the problem alone. So I, I, I hope So uh, just building on, can you explain the role of rainforests? You mentioned them uh, in one of uh, you, when you talk, you say you were using rainforests. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you use rainforests in your, uh, in your role? Sure. Um, so as part of our sustainability um, commitments publicly, uh, we aim to source, um, well, cu the current goal is 90% um, of sustainably sourced or recyclable uh, wood and paper fiber, um, whether it's in the packaging or the products that we use. Um, but it's, it's a pretty large supply chain. Um, so how do you figure out whether the stuff you're putting into your supply chain meets the requirements. Um, so we partnered uh, and are still in partnership with the Rainforest Alliance to help us verify data that we collect from our suppliers. And they do it through uh, supplier surveys, um, and the supplier surveys need to be um, corroborated by documentary evidence of chain of custody, meaning um, are they able to prove out step by step in the supply chain where that uh, wood and paper fiber actually um, comes from, which forest it actually comes from, et cetera. Um, that due diligence is then performed by Rainforest Alliance. We get a report, and that report um, actually helps us um, report our uh, performance against the obligations that we have. There is another question, maybe for Ruel or, or for you, Jessica, around the uh, persistence of some pollutant and material in the environment, which are not taken into account into LCA. So do you want to address that, uh, Ruel? Sure. So within, uh, within our tool, we adhere to the available standards that are out there uh, in the world. There are ISO norms and there are impact norms like CML and recipe. Um, uh, within recipe, there is what, yeah, this may be a very um, a deep question, eh? so, so I'm responding to that, but uh, um, so within recipe, um, there is ecotoxicity as a norm. So it's embedded in the, in the standards. We, as a technology provider, we really try to adhere in the standards. Now, that doesn't mean that the standards are not evolving over time, because also soil degradation, uh, soil quality, is something that requires improvement. But that is the same as in, uh, so we're discussing natural capital accounting, that is the same with financial accounting, that also evolves over the years. Uh, we know that this is not a perfect system, I agree, uh, so we need to work on the standards in the meantime, and we follow the standards. Thank you. Um, maybe Jessica, do you want to say anything on that? I mean, do you are more looking at the working, uh, you know, the working condition in the supply chain? So, looking at that. Side. Is anti-competition law a reason for company not to be transparent and as such act collectively? That's an interesting question. 
Do you, I mean, that will be an interesting question for you, Nina, because you're at the hand of the, so do you see different behavior from your supplier in, uh, um, because of potential competition low? Not to be transparent, not to be transparent, not to tell him. And, and I can understand the question, you know, related to sourcing raw material, being a, not willing to share with the sourcing because of a competition, you know, yeah. existing, so. Yeah. Well, let me say, um, I had the pleasure of actually introducing the supply chain, uh, the uh, social standards supply chain tool to our suppliers and that really was a lot of fun because um, we had close company with all the lawyers of all the suppliers because of course it is about disclosing the supply chain and not just only their own data but actually then going deeper in the supply chain to the factory level which means you have one contractual partner and that's all we knew once we started the process and then actually we had all of a sudden like 20 factories behind that one supplier it may also have been an importer, then it was even more complex. So I think the, to make it short, actually we ended up in um, good negotiations with um, disclosure agreements or non-disclosure agreements. So basically we, we as Metro had to obviously promise not to cut off, cut off um, the supplier and directly go to the factory to do our business. Um, vice versa, so the transparency basically was the, was the, um, the key um, asset that um, they had to provide to us, so it's obviously um, hard negotiation with the law firms. But I think anti-competition is not really the sweet spot here because, after all, it's really not a competitive factor to show transparency in your supply chains. It rather more is one of those elements where I believe there's a change of mindset necessary um, we do need the transparency in the supply chain, so it's uh, it's not state of the art anymore uh, to actually hold back on on that those aspects. So legal frameworks provide with some help here. Um, after all, there is a good uh, uh, yeah. piece about <laughs> having lawyers on the side. The chemical industry joined force together to um, actually build a system to you know get audit especially in emerging country, to be able to trace and, and being transparent. And this initiative was in, started in Europe by five leading companies, uh, Solvay, DSM, BSF, Axo, and Clarient. And they built this initiative called Together for Sustainability, where one audit for one is an audit for all. So they share and they, it's outsourced, and they share those results. So they go and audit the plant at the plant level to be able to do that. That initiative started from a procurement initiative. So the chief procurement officer joined force together and started an initiative, uh, TFS, Together for Sustainability. Today there is 22, 23 companies that joined that. So that exactly, so it's, actually able to share information about their supplier because they use sometimes same supplier. I can tell you that this initiative was challenged by an American company because of the potential you know, legal implication on competitive law, but it passed the, uh, it passed the test. So that's an example. There's a similar uh, initiative in the cosmetic industry that has started to same thing, being able to audit and join force to be able to uh, respond to the retailer or the brand owner about you know, traceability and, and uh, uh, transparency of the plant. So I think, I uh, yes, go ahead. I think, I think one key um, for, for most of us in the room probably audit fatigue is, is a big issue. Um, and I think the, the ability to consolidate, share useful data across audit reports is a great way to reduce audit fatigue. Um, there's no reason for codes to be you know, competing with each other when all the brand needs to know is whether or not the people in their supply chain are treated properly and are working in healthy and safe conditions. Very good. We have time for one more question, so let's look if there is one burning question that we did not. Uh, 
we have a question uh, for, can, for, I, can, for, can I propose uh, something? You asked a question dur after my presentation. Yes. How do you deal with the large number of suppliers? I yes. think that's a key topic for many, for many yes. companies. Go ahead. Yeah. If you so uh, one of the things we, uh, uh, we recognize that large corporates have a huge supplier base. So you cannot, uh, um, it's very challenging to engage with all your suppliers on environmental issues to get the environmental intelligence that we, uh, that we presented early on. So the key here to success, in my view, is that you really focus on the hotspots. And there is certainly that 80-20 rule, because you know that 80% of your environmental impact is usually made with 20% of your suppliers. So work with those suppliers to really establish an impact. And there, those collaborative platforms can be an outcome. Okay. There's one maybe question for you, Jessica. What are the most successful cases in DigiNext that you have um, to uh, use? You know, can you speak up on, on the Sure. Um, I mean, the application of blockchain outside financial services and specifically uh, in the area of creating greater traceability on, around working conditions, it's, it's really early days. Um, uh, generally, in blockchain, we compare it to the 1994, uh, the emergence of the Internet. You know, it's there. You know, it's disrupting um, and creating uh, enormous potential, in this case, around transparency. But we're really just at the start. Um, so, for this specific project, we have been into it um, for a couple of months only, um, working with the Mekong Club. Um, as I said, we have over 30 companies, multinationals, that are on board right now, and success very much depends on uh, collaborative efforts um, of those companies, uh, as well as other uh, key stakeholders. Um, so, we're working with uh, experts. Um, uh, around legislations, data protection and data privacy, uh, and also uh, looking to be linked more directly uh, to re regulatory bodies. Um, so w what we're doing right now is making sure that we get this product as quickly as possible from the lab into the field. We'll have our first pilots uh, in Thailand early November uh, and have uh, in, in conversations for two uh, uh, additional uh, pilot locations with uh, companies before the end of the year um, in Southeast Asia and the Middle East. So um, in, in terms of actually sharing successes of the application, it's too early, but we are making sure that we are really taking this uh, M, uh, MVP type approach, getting it out, understanding what are some of the additional questions that we need to, to raise, um, how are uh, the workers and migrant workers responding to the application so we can go very quickly to um, uh, an iterative process, and also we are looking um, for uh, more uh, companies to, to join us and really uh, volunteer um, uh, for the, the, the testing, piloting of this product as we um, want to make sure that the tool becomes as practical as possible, uh, and with the complexity of supply chains, we, we need to uh, get live data on it. So I hope this answers your question. Well, thank you very much. So let's uh, thank the panel for the discussion. They will be available uh, for lunch, and then lunch is waiting for us outside. So thank you very much. Thank you.